Hey okay, everybody, welcome back to East Future 9 G, your friendly, non-traditional pre-made black hottie. Okay. Um, welcome back. Uh, so the last time I told y'all, I told y'all just about like kind of how school I've been going, classes, um, just really talking heavy, heavy about academics and the program. Um, so this is a recap. I'm doing my master's in science and public health at Johns Hopkins, focusing on sexual and reproductive health um, and gestational health um, broadly. Um, so with that. Um, I wanted to come back and give y'all more information about just kind of my personal experience rather than just talking about my experience as a student. I wanted to talk more about like how I've been doing like mentally and like spiritually. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm here to get into. I just want to remind y'all to go ahead and subscribe, you know, run, tell a friend to come on up over here and subscribe too. And of course, like. So I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Okay, so after I got the rundown from everybody basically talking about how, like, you know, John Hopkins has, like, this little, you know, ups and downs, um, it's, it's, you know, a stereotypical PWI, like, they may not have all the resources that you need for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, especially not Black folks, um, so, you know, find your community early type of thing. And I was just like, okay, I'm prepared for that. I basically gone to PWIs my entire life. My family's military. We've moved around. Most of my schools have been predominantly white. I went to American University, a PWI, with a very, very racist culture. Um, so I was like, I'm prepared for this. I'm going to be fine. Um, but I actually wasn't. Because you got you to gotta think, like, for the past two or so years, I haven't had to really interact with white people on a daily basis. I haven't had to interact with anybody who wasn't Black or Indigenous on a daily basis for ex or for extended periods of time for the past two years. I have been a very, very, like, racially, at least racially safe space for the past two years due to COVID-19 and Delta and Omarion and, you know, everything that's going on. <laughs> um, so with that, it was just like okay it really hit me like the anti-blackness really hit me the institutionalized racism really hit me um and i'm in a predominantly white and predominantly asian space so it just you really do feel like an outsider um you know as a pre-medical student i can't just be doing this msph and not be taking advanced math and science courses so i've been loading up and I'll talk about that down the line too. I've been loading up my course load with advanced science, advanced, you know, bio, all the things that you can put on your on your uh, medical application, advanced science uh, uh, and advanced math courses. So I have, uh, you know, like I said, biostatistics and epidemiology um, for that first term. And in undergrad, I did not do that well in epidemiology because the professor was racist. But I was like, I don't care what this professor got going on. I'm going to do well in this course because I can't afford to not have the GPA that I want. You know, I ended up doing an MSPH because I'm trying to raise my math and science GPA. So I'm like, OK, I'm waking up early. I got a study schedule. I'm reading a textbook, which nobody else is doing. I'm reading a textbook every time, you know, every uh, every week to make sure I'm on top of my knowledge. Um, and I ended up getting a 97 in the class because of it um, and realizing that I actually do like epidemiology. I just really had a racist professor. Um, but one morning, I, I woke up at like 4 a.m. to study, and I'm like, yeah, girl, you're doing your I casually read that one of the most renowned, uh, you know, epidemiologists that we were going to be learning about was a eugenicist. And if you don't know about eugenics, it's basically like trying to say that Black, Indigenous, and people of color, you know, on a scale from Black to White, um, are less intelligent, um, have, you know, smaller cranial spaces, thicker skin, ape, like, it basically was trying to say that, like, Black people, and I'm speaking specifically on Black people, but we're talking about Black Indigenous people of color uh, in general, but Black people are where they're at because they are biologically, like, not able to succeed. Um, you know, eugenics comes from you know the justification for slavery and basically was birth to 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 justify the continued um discrimination against black indigenous and people of color black folks specifically um and the continued like low status of black folks basically blaming black folks for the design of white people um so i'm like i know i know my <laughs> reading about a eugenicist at 4, 4 a.m like that can't be how I started my day, but that was how I started my day. Um, and I definitely sent an email. I was like, y'all need to take this out the textbook. Like, I don't think y'all understand how destabilizing that is. 
as a black person to be trying to study and excel in a program that already has a very low acceptance rate of black folks and then see that I'm reading about somebody who hates me. Like, I'm reading about somebody who hates me right now. Like, so like why are you even talking about this person? Like, this person shouldn't even be brought up no more. They should be erased, you know? Like, they are not a person that we should be learning from. There are ample amounts of epidemiologists who are more worthy than somebody who was racist, right? So, I don't even get any work right now. Yeah. So then, you know, I'm studying my app. Like I said, I really want to raise my math and science GPA. So this epi class and the stats class, I'm like, I'm working my ass. I have to get A's in this class. I'm studying like 10 hours minimum a week for biostatistics. I'm not even able to study for all my other classes that I want to study. And I'm just like, why is this happening? Like, I'm actually really good at math and science. Um, and it turns out I was struggling because I didn't understand the type of English that they use. Like, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like, is everything okay? <laughs> like, it's unfortunately my native language. So like, I was speaking English my whole life, but it just really, you know, this class really drove home the fact that there is no average Black American home is speaking standard American English. We're just not. We're literally not. We're not speaking the English that is being used in academic spaces for one reason or another. The average Black American home, let alone the average Black American home, new Black American Southern home, we're not speaking that type of English. Like, that's not what we're doing at the dinner table. Like, so, you know, we very much so speak African American vernacular English. We very much so have our different slang. I think I, I think I talked about this last term, or not last term, I think I talked about this last video. Like, I'm from Louisiana. Our, word, our English is mixed with French and Spanish and, and so on and so forth. Like, I'm not speaking what the people speaking. And I didn't realize it until um, after one of our exams, I was just like, I just studied so hard. Like, why didn't I get an A? I was struggling just like many of the international students. And they were like, it's just the English is so hard for me. And that's when it clicked. I was like, damn, you know, I don't know if any of y'all study like, um, you know, black liberation theory or pan-African thought, et cetera, and so forth. But like, I will never be American, like no matter how much, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I will never be accepted as an American because I am black, because I am African. Like I will never, that is, ne that, is that will never be my cultural experience. So I'm, I'm being forced to be an American because everything else was stripped away from me, but there are always going to be things that will remind me that I am in fact not American. And this was one of those things, like this class, my inability to, as a person who has been speaking English since I was born, since I was able to speak, so over 27 years I've been speaking English and I still don't understand what these people are saying. I'm not American. Like, I would never be able to fully identify with the typical American experience. And so this just reminded me of that. And that was just kind of like, it was just another thing that made me feel like, like, I'm already dealing with imposter syndrome. I'm already dealing with like, damn, I'm 27. It took me so long to get here type of shit. Like, you know, I'm already dealing with all these like things that are feeding self-doubt. And that just added to it. Um, so it was, it was rough. <laughs> it was rough, you know. And I started having questions like, am I actually supposed to be here? Like, should I have just like kept doing all this other stuff? Or like, am I good enough to be here? Or, you know, all these different things. Um, so, so that was rough. The anti-blackness was real because we would ask, and, and, and I was also like, just not anti-blackness, the xenophobia, the, the, all the isms were just so real and so apparent to me because I'm like, many of us were emailing like, hey, can you provide like some interpretation? Your semantics are really, you know, like I'm really struggling with your semantics. I'm not struggling with the content. I know how to do statistical inference, but I'm struggling with the ways in which you're putting words together. And they wouldn't respond to emails. And it, it just was like, you actually don't care. Or at least it felt like this. You don't care that we learn this information because what you're testing me on is my ability to speak standard American English. You're not testing me on whether or not I know how to do statistical inference on whether or not I know how to do a linear regression. Like that's not what you're actually testing me on. Um, so, you know, I, I digress. Um, so like I said, I was excelling in all my classes. I ended up getting a B in statistics. I'm like, 
my math and science GPA is all I got. Like you don't know how how like non traditional medical students who have lower math and science GPAs are. Like we're literally hanging on a thread mentally every time we get back a math or science grade. Like, am I going to get every time we get like anything lower than an A? I'm like, am I going to get into medical school with this grade? Like, is my GPA going to be good enough? Are you know, my extracurricular activities going to be good enough to cover up this B that I just got? It's just it sends you down a spiral. It's really exhausting. <laughs> yeah so I'm like just assessing like what can I do now like uh, what do I need to do to ensure that I can get an A next term what do I need to do to to make the right environment so I was like maybe I just need to get on campus like I, I always I always need to be on campus like I can't be in my mom's house like I need to I need to be able to be focused on school and school alone so I ended up moving on campus like I said last video and um, I realized that I had just added another layer of stress onto my plate rather than removing one. At first I thought I was like, okay, I'm, you know, really trying to balance family and, you know, in the pursuit of medicine, that's not always what you, you, you can't always do that. And I was like, maybe this is just one of those times where I have to be really focused on school. Um, and that is the case. And as soon as I got here, I started to feel the weight of the anti-blackness, like even heavier, like it became unbearable like it became unbearable it's when i finally decided let me go ahead and like just disengage from social media or social media it's when i finally was like maybe i cannot hang around people maybe i just need to be focused 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 like i just became even more focused on school to the point where it was like i had no life um and i didn't really realize it until like the depression got so so bad like i stayed in my room for an entire month straight I'm sure it had to do with COVID, but it also just had to do with the the weight of like being surrounded by, you know, non-black people. Um, and I haven't had to do that for a while. Um, having to like make sure like my roommates are not black, like I had said, but worried that like my roommates are gonna be judging like my my everyday activities or the food that I make or different like things that I didn't even think about before they were now starting to be like my key score like key sources of anxiety like worry like dang I used to be able to just walk out of the house without like you know put my wig on or like without refreshing my hair I don't want my you know I don't look unkempt things that I thought I had dealt with I realized that like I did not like I, I didn't fully deal with those things it was like I'm just not gonna leave the house at all I'm gonna get my groceries delivered um, I'm just not gonna leave the house at all. I don't, I'm worried if I put my headscarf on and go downstairs, like that'll be helping. You know, all these different things that when you're confronted with anti-blackness, they start to come up. Because no matter, even if you have dealt with those things, those things still come to your mind because people still demonize blackness. So everything that I have pride in, like I love my head wraps, I love my natural hair, I work really hard to grow it and take care of it. Um, but I was immediately confronted with like the ways in which people don't love those things you know um it was it was rough. sparsely i would see like a black student and i get really excited but like the only people who look like me happen to be staff um and i'm just grateful that they're here <laughs> first off because they have saved my grades many a times and also um why well, didn't expect to get emotional <laughs> um I, it was like uh, like having a conversation um, with one of the engineers here. Um, I, I realized um, that I was like in a deep depression. You know how sometimes you're like, actually I'm not depressed, I'm not depressed, I'm not depressed. And then it was something he said that it just like clicked. Like, you struggling, like <laughs> you are struggling. Like, and you need to, <laughs> you need to come up out of this. Um, I was downstairs. I didn't. I think this was before Thanksgiving break or, or something like that. I don't know. I was downstairs and I was talking to like um, one of the amazing women in front of this and I was talking to one of the engineers and he, he was like, oh, you know, he's like, how you like Baltimore? He was like, you seem different. Like you always come down and say hey to us, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I was just like, yeah. And he was like, how you like it though? And I could tell he was like, not asking me some surface level shit. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, the energy here is weird. And he was like, oh, you feel it too? And I was just like, wait, like, so I'm not tripping. And then he was like, I'm glad you realized that. He was like, it's real different here. He was like, you can tell like, you know, where John Hopkins begins and where the rest of the city, you know, begins. Um, and I was like, 
explain this more to me because now I'm starting to feel like <laughs> I'm like I'm I think I'm like coming out of my dissociated state like and then he was like yeah like you know they treat black people really different here like you know blah blah blah, blah. and then it was something that he said to me that brought me all the way back into my body and he was like because I had just been telling him I was like yeah the energy is real different I just I could I can feel the racism like I can feel the haves and the have nots going on around here I was like so much he was like so you know why don't you go out into the community and this and the third I was like I've been in my room since I've been here um and at that time I had been there for a month like I said he was like that sounds like jail and I was like I have never compared my experience to jail I have family that has been incarcerated um, and I have family that, you know, has had run-ins with the carceral system. So I don't, I will never compare my privileged life to that. And then he was like, no, that's jail. He was like, take it from me. And I don't know <laughs> what happened, but I was just like, <laughs> I've really been not, um, I have not been living, um, And I think, like, I think, um, I think, like, a day or so after that, I was like, we gotta, we gotta come up out of this because they're not gonna take away my joy. <laughs> um, you know, I worked really hard to be here, and while everything's not how I thought it was gonna be, it wasn't how I envisioned it, it doesn't mean that this is any less of a blessing or, like, any less of an opportunity. Um, I was just like, why am I feeling this way? Why is it so heavy? And outside of the fact, like outside of the fact that I had really like talked this place up in my mind um, and it not be everything that I had, you know, imagined. Um, I also, like I said, I'm very like spiritually inclined um, and I'm not going to get too deep into that because everybody don't need to know about what we got going on. Um, but... You know, my dad are very much so always with me, always around me. Um, and I interpreted what had been going on. So I'm like, I know when I'm depressed, but this is a, it's very much so different from that. This is deeper. And I just interpreted that as like my dad communicating, like, you know, communicating not only their feelings, like now being introduced to this space, but also communicating to me the feelings of, you know the dead of the community members around here like this place is very very much so the result of a very sophisticated system of institutionalized racism like the haves are overwhelmingly white and the have-nots are overwhelmingly black and you know that takes a toll on on everybody like psychologically you know mentally physically and it, it was like a, a weird, like a surreal realization because I'm like, I'm at a school that is like on paper working really hard to improve outcomes of underserved and marginalized communities um, in the United States and around the world. But I'm looking at, I'm looking at, you know, black Baltimoreans right outside the damn Johns Hopkins community, like, I guess, imaginary line, and it's suffering, like, actually suffering, like, it's bandos literally two streets over, and I just, I, none of that made sense to me, and I feel like, the, I feel like what I was feeling was, like, that, the manifestation of that, like, the communication of that, um, and so it just took a lot of, like, reflection and, like, um, I guess like a shift had to happen so that I could not be bogged down by that, but instead um, allow that to become like my fuel, I guess, and allow that to drive the way that I engage with not only the content that I'm being taught, it's predominantly white institution, but also like the people, the networks, um, you know, so on and so forth, uh, because I can't fumble like I've give, I've been given access to something that many, you know, black, indigenous and people of color uh, don't get access to. Um, and it's like my duty now that I have access to take this knowledge that's supposed to be so elite and so world class and bring it back to my community. Um, and also to take this knowledge, but not forget the importance of the knowledge that 
I find and I gain in community. Like the community knowledge is better, but I also got to know what the people who are in power, the people who are in control are doing, right? In order to be able to affect change. Like that's what myself, that's what I, as somebody who has access, as somebody who has privilege, um, that's my job, that's my duty. So I can't be fumbling and I can't be, you know, yeah, I can't be fumbling in the bag. I can't be getting depressed. I can't be, I mean, I can be depressed. Like I'm allowed to be human and mental health is, you know, I can't pretend as if, you know, um, you know, mental health is not real. Um, but I gotta, I gotta get my shit together because I have, a, I have a job to do. <laughs> I have a job to do. Um, like many other black um, indigenous people of color who happen to be in spaces like this or this space specifically. So yeah, and now I guess I'm still, I'm, I'm excited. And I've just been using this time to, to come back to myself, come back to community, improve my spiritual health because I ain't gonna lie, I was slacking. Like I don't have my altar set up. I don't have nothing going on. And um, I feel like that is one reason why I felt this so heavily, you know? Um, so in getting my spiritual health together, getting in touch with a therapist, um, you know, making time to spend time with family and, 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 and loved ones and chosen family as well, because I can't, I don't, I can't survive without that in this environment. And that is something that I was able to solidify in my mind. Um, and just becoming even more organized, becoming even more disciplined, but not in the way that I was doing it second term. Second term, I was more disciplined, but it was like punishment. I was literally punishing myself for being human. Now I'm becoming more disciplined in that I am rewarding myself for my humanity. I am rewarding myself for like the love. <laughs> I'm like rewarding myself for the love that I have for my community by like acknowledging the pain that is sustained while I'm being in this environment and also acknowledging the opportunity that I have um, and, and, and looking at the end goal and, and, and reminding myself of the why and, and you know, envisioning, you know, like have, trying to, to, to do what you need to do in order to self-actualize. So like envisioning what it's gonna be like to have this knowledge and be able to go back to community and be like, all right, y'all, this is what I know. This is what they taught me and, and, and work with people in community. And they'd be like, well, I kind of had this idea. And be like, well, I have access to this. I have this network, I have that. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just looking at all the bright sides, right? <laughs> all the better, all the better angles. I literally just had a shift in perspective. And so I guess I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying that it got like easier or anything like that. And I'm also not saying that like, I don't expect for third term or for fourth term or any of the remaining uh, terms that happen in, in these two years in this program, I'm not expecting for them to be e any easier. But I do feel like my approach is um, a healthier approach now, you know? I'm not trying to treat myself like a robot anymore. Um, I'm moving, I'm moving better, baby. You know, I'm, sh I'm shaking back. Um, and I'm like happy, I'm, I'm, I'm happier. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's kind of all I have for y'all today, but um, yeah, say something in the comments below. Let me know like what you're you're thinking and let me know if you've had experience like this or haven't had an experience like this. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see y'all next week.